To some, Hearn the Hunter is a ghost associated with Windsor Great Park. He haunts the tree where he died, rattling his chains and raging against, well, something. Elsewhere, Hearn is portrayed as a demonic force tearing through the forest at speed, scooping up souls in the wild hunt. Some tales see him riding a coal black horse with burning eyes, while others see him as a phantom stag that prefers to chase than be chased. So is Hearn the Hunter simply an invention of Shakespeare, or does he have a basis in reality? And why do the legends about him vary so wildly? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you enjoyed the King Arthur episode last week. I quite enjoyed putting it together. And this week, we're going to move on to Hearn the Hunter. And this was quite the rabbit hole to fall down. So I hope you enjoy what I've ended up coming up with. But before I forget, I do want to say that this episode was brought to you by Peach, which in the Victorian language of flowers meant your qualities like your charms are unequaled. And I think that would be such a lovely message to get if someone were to send you that. And I wonder, does anyone ever listen to these thinking, oh, is she sending a message to someone? No, not really. I'm just picking ones that I think sound cool, quite honestly. But yeah. If anyone ever wanted to send me a message, then just send me a picture of one of these plants would be a good one. And like I say, one of the problems you've got to be wary about with the language of flowers is sometimes the meanings vary across dictionaries. And the one I prefer is Mrs. Burke's 1865 dictionary, which you can find on archive.org. But anyway, on to this week's episode. We are doing Hearn the Hunter. And I did find out about him years ago, and I can't remember where, but I think he appeared in one of those, like witchcraft 101 book kind of things that you read when you're 16 and I can't remember what the context was that he was mentioned in and then I was sort of I was dimly aware of him and then I came across him in relation to Windsor and that's why I was kind of like what 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 is going on here and that's why we're going to start off with Hearn the Hunter's first appearance in writing and this it kind of explains the link with Windsor because he appears in Shakespeare's play The Merry Wives of Windsor from 1597. Now, in Act 4, Scene 4, two women refer to an old tale about Hearn, who was once a keeper in the forest at Windsor. Now, according to this tale, Hearn walks around an oak tree at midnight in the winter. They also mention his great ragged horns, his tendency to blast trees, and also bewitch cattle, and he turns cows milk bloody, all while rattling a chain. I don't necessarily think he's doing all of those things simultaneously, but they're the qualities that are ascribed to him. Now, Leah S. Marcus actually suggests that Hearn is apparently Shakespeare's invention, and even in the play, one of the wives does note the stories about Hearn are mere inventions. Now, one of the things that we do need to bear in mind about Shakespeare, and this is something that Morgan Daimler brought up, is that Shakespeare often included things that people would have recognised in his plays. And if there were legends of ghosts in Windsor Park, then locally people may have heard of them, and then therefore it would have made sense for Shakespeare to include them in his play. Now, obviously, we don't know to what extent his version of such local stories might be what you would call accurate, because as Jeremy Hart points out, Shakespeare used folklore to enrich his plays, not to create, and I quote, literal transcriptions of folk belief, end quote. So here, obviously, it's folklore being kind of used as part of the world building, as it were, rather than it being a direct thing in the play. Now, what's interesting is one of the trees in Windsor Park actually bore the name Falstaff's Oak after the Shakespeare character who disguises himself as Hearn rather than Hearn's Oak. And people couldn't quite agree on which tree that was. The most likely specimen was actually felled in 1796 because it was half dead and a storm blew down another possibility in 1863 and a replacement was planted in 1906. Now, up until the late 18th century, this was pretty much as much information that was actually available about Hearn. And Jennifer Westwood notes the common nature of Hearn, or indeed Horn, as a medieval surname, making it difficult to identify a real individual behind the story. Now, some have noted a woodsman named Horn during Henry VIII's reign who may have provided his name, if nothing else. And Hearn is actually referred to as Horn in earlier drafts of Shakespeare's play, so there is a possible link there. 
Now, Hart also notes that The Merry Wives of Windsor was actually largely ignored until the 1720s when it enjoyed a revival, which coincided with the growth of tourism in England, and a 1742 map of Windsor actually noted Sir John Falstaff's Oak. And like I said before, if the story of Hearn the Hunter was locally famous, then surely the map would note Hearn's Oak and not the name of a Shakespearean character. Something to bear in mind. Yet Samuel Ireland then extended the story in 1792, saying that Hearn had actually been a gamekeeper, which sort of fits in with the idea of him being a woodsman under Henry VIII, but that Hearn had actually completed suicide by hanging on the oak. And this explains Hearn's continual haunting of this particular tree. Now, according to this version of the story, Hearn feared losing his job due to an unspecified crime. But that doesn't really explain the more bizarre parts of the tale if we take Shakespeare's description as a representation of a local legend. So why would Hearn blast trees and bewitch cattle and why would he turn cows milk bloody? Because as Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd point out, that's what we'd expect from witches or malicious fairies and it's not standard ghost behaviour at all. That said, Hart does note that as a keeper of the forest, Hearn would have had the power to fell trees and evict grazing cattle to preserve land for deer. So is Hearn the hunter a metaphor rather than a literal ghost? And have these behaviours from how we would have been in life then somehow influenced his story? And as for Hearn having antlers, it's also possible that Shakespeare simply added that himself a dramatic effect. Because, as Westwood puts it, the antlers could be, and I quote, a reference to Cuckold's horns, end quote, something familiar to Elizabethan audiences. And the antlers thus become part of Falstaff's costume when he dresses as Hearn, as part of the no doubt hilarious Shakespearean comedy. So, as I say, it could just be artistic license. Now, the antlers being Shakespeare's edition of the story is the more likely explanation since ghost stags are pretty rare in popular belief compared to other animals like dogs, bulls or pigs. Or, of course, horses as well. Hart also suggests that people in remote communities believed that wicked men took the form of animals as ghosts up until the 19th century, so a forest keeper would certainly be considered wicked by the rest of the community. Now, authors in the 19th century began to add their own ideas onto the figure of Hearn, and in the novel Windsor Castle from 1843, Harrison Ainsworth claims that Hearn had been a forester who was gored by a stag, only to be spared by the devil. Now, the condition was that Hearn would wear antlers, except he also lost his skills as a huntsman as part of this bargain with the devil. And this link between Hearn and the devil is partially responsible for the 20th century descriptions of him as either Canunos or the leader of the wild hunt. And this is where I think I first encountered Hearn the Hunter, because somebody had named him as a leader of the wild hunt, and I honestly can't remember which book it was in. But that, as I said at the beginning, that was why I was so confused when I discovered the Windsor Great Park link. And according to Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd, it was Jacob Grimm who first suggested that Hearn led the wild hunt. Now, the link is tenuous at best, and it largely seems to come from the fact that most of you will have heard of Odin, the Norse god. Well, the Germanic tribes that came to Britain called him Wotan, and he apparently led the wild hunt to collect souls. And his title as head of the hunt was Herion, and this sounds like Grimm's tendency to syncretise completely disparate deities simply because their names sounded vaguely similar. So Herion in relation to the Wild Hunt then becomes Hearn and I think that's possibly where the misidentification comes from. But the problem is the whole point of the Wild Hunt is its headlong dash from a starting point to an end point and in some legends that does occur in midair. And none of Shakespeare's version of Hearn fits the Wild Hunt at all. And even the stories that say Hearn leads the wild hunt describe him hanging around a specific tree, which doesn't sound particularly hunt-like, does it? Of course, some people have tried to link Hearn's antlers with dances at various festivals, suggesting that he may have been a common character portrayed during Midwinter Rites. If that was the case, I would expect that we would see that in other places as well, not just Windsor. And others, as I said before, have tried to claim Hearn as a variation of Canunos, although the evidence for this is scant at best, other than the both having horns, or in Hearn's case, antlers. Now, Margaret Murray even invokes Hearn the Hunter as the English Canunos because, of course, she does. And it's quite interesting because Gregory Wright does point out there is a bit of a disparity here because Canunos is usually portrayed as a nature defender, where Hearn does the opposite. So... I think in some cases, just because you've got a male figure with horns, it doesn't automatically make him a version of Canunos. And I would also argue that you can see there being a bit of a difference between horns and antlers. Just saying. <laughs> 
Now, in 1922, Harold Peake tried to link her to the Harlequin, an evil spirit that in French legends was the leader of the dead, or related to, and I quote, a group of ghosts who rode abroad like a cavalcade of wild huntsmen, end quote. And Peake suggested that such a character then became Hearn the Hunter in Windsor, which makes little sense given the lack of information about him prior to Shakespeare's play, and it depends more upon the wild hunt than it does any of the descriptions given in The Merry Wives of Windsor. But it seems this link between Hearn the Hunter and the Wild Hunt actually stuck, because in 1926 the wife and daughter of a Justice of the Peace claimed to have heard the deep-throated baying of the Spectre Hounds twice at midnight. The new story even goes out of its way to say that Hearn and his ghostly pack of hounds was immortalised in The Merry Wives of Windsor, despite the fact that the dogs make no such appearance in the play. Mrs Legg, the wife in question, described the being as faint, growing louder and then dying away as it moved in the direction of Windsor Castle, and she even likened it to the being of wolfhounds, which is exceptionally specific. Now she and her daughter then heard it again two weeks later, and it was her daughter that assumed they were Hearn's hounds. In 1947, a Mr K Stone wrote to the Daily Mirror and asked to hear about the legend of Hearn the Hunter, and the response focused on, and I quote, a ghostly hunter who, with his pack of dogs, frequented certain forests, end quote. So here, Hearn's been given a much wider territory than just Windsor Great Park, because he's now frequenting certain forests. Nope, only ever been linked with Windsor. And what's even stranger is this article talks about the same hunter appearing in the Black Forest in German law and Fontainebleau in French law, and then Hearn the Hunter just simply becomes England's version. But even here, the newspaper includes his background as a keeper in Windsor Forest, seeing him appear at midnight in the winter, rattling a chain. So why use Shakespeare's description if you're going to then link him to the Wild Hunt? And the mistakes just pile up. I found a newspaper from 1943 that described Hearn as, and I quote, a famous outlaw of the Middle Ages who lived in Windsor Forest and plundered the townspeople for food, end quote. And I'm not going to lie, that makes it sound like Hearn was actually eating the townspeople. There's not really any mention of him being an outlaw anywhere else. And he's n- I wouldn't necessarily even call him famous. So Hearn here then ends up getting a whole load of other stuff ascribed to him that's probably not actually got anything to do with him. Now, Hearn took on a different aspect again in the 20th century, that of a predictive omen. So, according to this legend, people see him before the death of the monarch or national disasters. At least that's what the folklore says. I couldn't actually find any mention of sightings before the death of the late Queen in September 2022, and the newspaper stories in the 1940s all focus on his legend, not the sightings. And you would think if you're going to talk about national disasters, the Second World War would be a pretty good one. And it does seem, as far as Jeremy Hart says, that nothing seems to appear after 1952. So it does seem that the conceit of Hearn as the head of the Wild Hunt scooping up the souls of the dead has somehow morphed into him becoming a death omen. But like I say, surely that would continue to be the case even now. So what do we ultimately make of Hearn the Hunter? Well, it's entirely possible that Hearn was a real person onto which Shakespeare overlaid a ghost story simply because it suited his plot to do so. So rather than reflecting local folklore, he might have given local gossip a supernatural flavour. And let's be honest, writers have done worse. And it always makes me think of that line out of A Knight's Tale when Chaucer turns around and says, I'm a writer, I give truth scope. It's that kind of thing. And I do think as well it's entirely possible that Shakespeare was just taking a snippet of something that people were maybe gossiping about Hearn if he was a forest keeper because he would have been keeping people out of a space that they would have seen that they should have had access to. So he wouldn't have been viewed in a particularly positive light. So then depicting him in this way, Shakespeare's then kind of taken that animosity towards him and then turned it into something for dramatic effect, which obviously is something that he's entirely entitled to do. But in turn, that inspired other writers to then further embellish the legend that Shakespeare had already come up with, with the story distorted every time someone linked it to something else. So perhaps the legend of Hearn the Hunter takes us from a despised local forest keeper to an ancient Celtic god through a folkloric version of Telephone. And who knows, if you believe in the concept of egregores, if enough people now believe Hearn the Hunter is a forest god, then maybe he is. And the concept of an egregore is basically if enough people give something attention it will develop its own form as like a thought form in a lot of ways so if enough people think that Hearn the Hunter is a forest god and they put enough energy and thought into that then that would indeed create an egregore of Hearn the Hunter so it's entirely possible that everybody's correct and everybody's not quite correct at the same time 
because given that much of what we, and I say this in inverted commas, know comes from the Merry Wives of Windsor and then the novel Windsor Castle, we do have to be wary of taking folklore from fiction because quite simply, writers take artistic license with their creations. That's part of the fun of being a writer. True, they might simply retell the folklore, preserving it for readers, or they might add their own inventions, meaning it's quite difficult to know what is fact, what is fiction and what is folklore. Now, Hearn becomes the ideal candidate for this both and approach that I often mention on the podcast because we can know all of these contradictions and believe none of them at the same time because whether they're true or not is actually beside the point. What's important is the fact that all of these contradictions tell us something about the time in which they emerged. Though, as always, it might still be an idea to keep your wits about you if you find yourself wandering about in Windsor Great Park at midnight. So what I want to know is, had you heard of Hearn the Hunter? Because I tend to find that people have heard the name or they maybe know like snippets of it, but maybe not as much as they think they do when they stop to think about it. Other people obviously much more au fait with him. So please do feel free to let me know whether you've heard of Hearn the Hunter or not. Do you believe that he was just invented by Shakespeare and he's taken on a life of his own from there? Do you believe that he was actually just an ordinary person who then somehow got immortalised in fiction, kind of almost by accident? Was he actually some kind of pan-Celtic deity, which is really unlikely because of the fact there's no mention of him before Shakespeare's play. So you do have to bear that in mind as well. And there's no material evidence of any kind of Canunos worship from Windsor Great Park. So again, bear that in mind. But please do feel free to let me know what you think. Next week, we're going to be having a look at Queen Mab. And I just, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to doing that one because I just think it'll be a really interesting episode. Although, and I'm going to mention this quite a lot in the episode itself, my favourite Arthurian depiction was the Channel 4 series based around Merlin, where Sam Neill played Merlin and Miranda Richardson played Queen Mab. So every time I talk about Queen Mab, I'm going to be thinking of Miranda Richardson, just so you know. <laughs> but that is side, I hope that you have a marvellous week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.